All right, yes, we haven't had enough on gradual typing, right? Uh, I'm not gonna stand in front of the podium because I'm unbelievably loud, and so if I stand in front of the podium, then it'll blow out all the speakers. I'm gonna stay away from the microphone. I've done that before, it's bad. So this is yet another response to is gradual typing dead? And yet another uh, kinda no, uh, but we're taking a different approach. The approach here is the virtual machine was already doing things related to types, we take advantage of that. So here's the background. Hey, you just saw two talks on gradual typing. Yay, okay, let's move on. Well, okay, what's gradual typing? Eh, we have a program. In this case, I'm writing it in JavaScript because somehow I ended up in that hell. Uh, and it might be in TypeScript, so you can add a type annotation optionally. And the problem with gradual typing, well, they, we want them to be checked when they're present. We want them to be checked at runtime at the boundaries between typed and untyped code, but that means that if we have structural types or we have functional types, we can't just fully check them when they appear. We can't get a value and immediately say, aha, this is a node in a list, because a node in a list is a recursive type and that would involve checking an infinite number of things. So instead we delay the checks and only check when we get to something that is actually checkable, get to a primitive value, get to something where we can just look at a tag or something like that. And that has created the impression that in gradual typing you add types to go slow. That's not completely fair because a fully typed program can take advantage of those, that type information and go fast, but yes, a lot of these gradually typed languages, if you take a fully untyped program and add some types, you go slower which just feels wrong, as Nate already pointed out. The other side of this is virtual machines. So here's a very simple snippet of a JavaScript program. It adds x.a and x.b. You can imagine that internally that might be some SSA form, so it's gonna have an instruction that gets a out of x, an instruction that gets b out of x, and then an instruction that adds them together. And intuitively you might think, I'm just doing a hash table lookup. This is an object, I'm looking it up in a hash table, but, Virtual machines are cleverer than that because they use just-in-time compilation. So they're not compiling this knowing only this, they're compiling knowing the code they're compiling and some witness. They have an actual value that has reached x. Often they have many values that have reached x. And so we're going to design the format of objects in this virtual machine so that having these witnesses makes us able to compile the code more efficiently. And it ends up looking something like this. We divide it into a shape and a store. You've probably heard of the shape under various different names. Hidden class, I don't like to call it a hidden class because it's not a class and it's not hidden. Uh, shape, structure, uh, map, all sorts of other things. And the idea is we're going to put everything about the structure of this object that we expect many objects to share here. The shape maps the field names to the offsets in the store, and every object that has the same layout has referentially the same shape. So it acts almost like a class pointer, which is why hidden classes is the term that's so often used. And that gives us code that looks a little bit more like this. We have some static cache where we keep a shape we've seen before. If we see the same shape again, then we just get the offsets that we knew because we cached a shape we'd already seen, the shape tells us where everything is in the object, we're done. And if we see a different shape, if we see a shape we're not familiar with, we compile the code. Make a new version, we've seen a new shape, do something different. So you can always count on knowing the shape because you've compiled the code with a particular shape that you know. So this is standard, this is self, this is small talk, this is certainly every JavaScript virtual machine, and quite simply to make sure that everything has the same shape, you keep all of your shapes in a tree, you have a global reference that is the empty shape, if I add item to, a, uh, to an object, I get a shape that looks like this, that says item is at location zero, if I add next, I get a shape that looks like this, that says item is at location zero, and next is at location one, and so any object that has shape Two, I know exactly where to look up all of the fields of that object. An extension that uh, I worked on at uh, Truffle, or uh, at Oracle with Truffle, was this next problem of, well, if we're in JavaScript and we want to add two things, 
We can add anything. We can add integers, we can add floats, we can add strings. So we have to then check the types of that. Typically that just involves checking a few bits, checking a tag. But the trick to make that faster is, hey, put that in the shape too. So if I add an item field that is a number, I get a distinct shape from if I add an item field that is a string. And that way, objects that have an item that is a number and an item that is a string are instantly differentiable from each other in that they have different shapes. If we cache one shape, we automatically know not just what's there in the object, but the type of everything that's there in the object as well. So now, we do this singular check. We know the shape of the object. We know all of the types of all of the members of the object. We know where to find everything. And so, all of this is just like it would be in C or Java. And that's because that single check gives us pretty much a Java-like class. It's not quite because it's shallow, it's not deep, but for our purposes, basically that gives us a Java-like class. So, oh, and another bit of background. So we use a lazy basic block versioning uh, based uh, JIT. This is from Montreal. I'm not gonna talk about the details because I don't need it for this talk, but it's really cool, you should look at it. It's called Higgs, it's from Montreal. Okay, so somehow gradual, uh, gradually typed languages have been using these types to go slow, while the virtual machines also need the types to go fast. How did we end up in that world? Well, simply there's an impedance mismatch. The virtual machines are using the types in one way, gradually typed languages are using them in a different way, and the point of this work was to see if we could sort of munge gradually typed languages and munge VMs a bit to get a compromise that maybe gets something in between. How do we do that? Well, we're gonna put gradual type checking in the virtual machine. So here's our actual work. So first off, we know that there's this concept of shape. What we want to do is say, this doesn't just tell us the types, but it's going to restrict the types. So we're gonna add a concept called contract, intrinsic object contract. I don't wanna stretch the term contracts too far. These aren't really contracts in the classic sense. Quite simply, an object is going to have all of its fields, all the types of the fields, et cetera, and contracts which are an enforcement of the types in the fields. So if a object has a contract that says that field item must be a number, then in the virtual machine, in the implementation of, in this case, JavaScript, we just don't let you put into the item field anything that isn't a number. So the contracts enforce those type properties, and they give us primitive types as well as the types of the field, so we can do recursive contracts, we can say, this field must have this contract. And then in the virtual machine, we just check every time you act as a field. Now, you've probably noted at this point that I'm sure talking a lot about objects. Indeed, I'm doing this in JavaScript and I'm focused a lot on objects. Your immediate next question is going to be, so how do you support functions? And the answer is poorly, uh, but it's not sort of a fundamental restriction. We were sort of stuck with what is the VM already doing? We're building up from there. So here's what they look like. We have some code that says, give me a contract that says this object has to be, well, an object, a contract that says this value has to be a number. We can add new fields. Contracts are mostly immutable. Star, look at the paper. So you can build a new contract that says, this builds on this contract that says it has to be an object, but also it has to have an item field that is of type number. It also has to have a next field, which is, well, we're building a list, so it's a pointer to itself. So this contract says I have an object, it has an item field that is a number, it has a next field that is also of this contract, of this type. And when we do contract check, that's built into the virtual machine, and it checks any primitive obligations. So in this case, it has to be an object, and it applies the contract to the object. All that that means is that in the future, when we try to access a field, whether writing to it or reading from it, we're going to check for each contract that we have previously applied to this object. If it has an obligation over the field we care about, then do a contract check. That obligation is also a contract. That gives us the recursivity. 
If we do O dot next, then we're going to apply the contract to the next uh, step in this chain, and we'll keep applying the contracts down. Since we check the primitive obligation here, if we end up actually trying to write something invalid, this will throw the error. That gives us the types we want. They're nice, they're structural types. They do what we need. So, this involves extending the virtual machine when we do memory access, function calls, etc., to do these contract checks. Uh, when you add contracts, that always incurs more checks. So, we are only moving towards a more checked domain. Uh, which, you know, could be a problem, but we'll see. Contracts are never revoked. So when you put a contract on an object, it gets more precise. That puts us in what are called the monotonic semantics in gradual typing. Uh, I, I don't want to go into a lot of details about this. It has its upsides, it has, has its downsides. But suffice it to say that if I say this is a list of integers, I can never later say I want to add anything to it because too bad, somebody wanted it to be a list of integers. Full details on that are, of course, in the paper. So that's the semantics we want. That's what we're going to build. And if you remember my discussion about shapes, you can probably guess how we're going to make this fast. We're going to take the contract and we're going to put them in the shape. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's the, that's the entire paper. Take the contracts, put them in the shape. That's everything. The shape already stores type information, so it tells us what the types are. The contracts tells us what the types must be, so put the contracts in the shapes. That way, if you cache the shape, you've cached the types of all of the fields and the obligations over the types of the fields. You know what they are and what they're allowed to be. And those obligations are almost always redundant with things you already knew. Because you were already caching the shape. The VM already knew that. Hey, that's the title. So that gives us a shape tree that looks like this. This is too small to read. Let me zoom in a little bit. So if I have a contract that says, or sorry, if I have a shape that says I is at location zero, Next is at location one, so that tells us how the object is laying out. Item is a number. Next is an object, so that tells us the primitive types of the fields of this object. I can take a step in the shape tree that doesn't change the actual shape per se. This shape describes the same object, it has the same fields, but it adds a contract. And that contract says, Next must be, is obliged to, the same contract. So that's our recursion. This is a list. Next is going to be uh, obliged to itself. And that the item member is obliged to contract one, which was just the contract that says it's a number. So when we have an object with this shape, we know where item is, where next is, what item is, what next is, what item is allowed to be, and what next is allowed to be. And we know all of that just from catching this shape. One check, does it have this shape, tells us all of that. So, how do we compile with that information? Well, if I want to do o.item equals quote foo, we said that the item field has to be a number, so we should expect this to fail. We're going to compile this into some code that has a cached shape. It's seen some witness value. It knows a shape that might reach there. If it doesn't have that shape, we just recompile. So now we're going to insert some checks and do the actual update, perhaps. What do we know? Well, we know all of the contracts of O because we have O's shape. We cached the shape. We know that at compile time. We know that while we're compiling the code. And we know that foo is a string. Okay, that's kind of obvious. We know that foo is a string because it's a string literal. But still, we know that foo is a string. Well, that's wrong. We know that contract can't work, so we compile this into fail. What if we do something that's not quite so stupid? We try to put a number into it. We know that O has a contract that says it has to be a number. We know that 42 is a number, and so we compile it into, oh, we're done. We don't need to do any checks. We already knew it was a number. 
We know that's a number. We know from the cache shape that it has to be a number. Don't do any checks. Let's make it a bit more interesting by having it actually be an object. So let's assume that we've been using x. So somewhere up above, we cached the shape of x, and it's cached shape 1. And we want to set o.next equals x. So we know the shapes of x and o. Thus, we know all of the contracts that x and o have. We know that o has a contract over next. So we know that if that, or we know whether x has that contract, and we know all of the contracts already applied to x. So what is the implication of doing this assignment? Well, we should put any contract that next requires onto x. We already know what contract x has. So if x already has that contract, we're done. We do nothing more, no checks needed. If x doesn't have the contract, well, the contract is just another shape. So we change the shape, and that's it. One assignment, no actual checking required. We're done. Now, we do have to actually check something if we know, oh, so we cached x to the shape so we know what shape to transition to. We do have to actually worry if we know nothing about x. If x is just some blind value, we know nothing about it, well, we're going to have to check is x an object? Is x's shape the shape we expect it to be? Is o's shape the shape we expect it to be? And then do the assignment. So we're only incurring the check if the VM didn't already know that. But the VM probably already knew that. So those checks are redundant so long as you've used the value at some point. If you've used the value, then you've cached its shape. So that's all we need. As for the details to the implementation, we stick blame in the shape as well. This isn't ideal, but it does give us blame tracking. The consequence of doing all of this is polymorphism. So if you do have multiple shapes that can appear, they might be trivially different. They might have the same fields and just different contracts. In which case, I'm going to have a bunch of different branches that say, if it's this shape, do this. If it's this shape, do this. If it's this shape, do this. That's not ideal. It's not horribly slow, but it does blow up the code. And as I said, our function support right now is very limited. It is improving. It's nothing fundamentally restrictive about it. But all of these shapes have to do with object features. So we've been focusing on object features. Uh, this in a sort of remake of safe TypeScript. Safe TypeScript is just TypeScript with checks. And like I said, we check everywhere. We don't check in certain cases. We always check. Now, the question, of course, this being the is sound gradual typing dead due to performance session, basically, with apologies to the poor last paper who got stuck in with uh, our brawl. So how is the performance? I don't have the sort of uh, graph over all of the various levels of typing because we can add type annotations at any point, so we have trillions upon trillions of possible programs. We took some of the programs from the Is Sound Gradual Typing Dead paper, we took the benchmarks from uh, the Safe TypeScript paper and the TypeScript compiler itself. By the way, does anybody know of a benchmark called Kenneth? That's my middle name. I'd like to complete that trifecta. And, well, our slowdowns are measured in percent, because almost always we get rid of the checks. The checks just don't happen. Hey, there's an elephant in the room. We have three papers, all of which are on basically the same topic, and all of which have vastly different approaches to how to solve that problem. I want to nip a few of the questions in the bud by just looking at some of the distinctions with apologies to the other authors who I'm sure will despise this comparison. So, sorry Sam, but we do still live in the add types to go slow part of gradual typing. I don't offer speed up. If you fully type type racket, you do get speed up, but only fully typed. Whereas they actually can add types to go fast. So that's cool. That's a nice feature. The uh, picket system is an incredibly sophisticated solution that allows you to do anything. The, uh, the nom system 
it was, let's design a system that isn't so ridiculously complicated in the first place, so they're solving a simple problem. We're doing a more sophisticated solution to a simpler problem. We don't have as uh, sophisticated of contracts, so we have a simpler problem, but we still have more, uh, more that we can represent. That makes Picket very, very general. Any contract you can imagine, they can do. Uh, much more restrictive in nom, it has to be a nominal type, it arises as part of the type. We are maybe a compromise, that's obviously a very positive way of viewing myself. Uh, in nom and in us, types become part of the value. In nom, because they're nominal, it just arises naturally, it's always been part of the value. In us, because we use monotonic semantics, so you actually change the value and ratchet it, uh, ratchet it down. That's not true in type racket in general. So they don't have these problems of, I casted a list of any to a list of int, and now it's stuck as a list of int forever. Uh, racket is kind of mostly functional, that's not actually fair at all. Uh, but we are object oriented on this side, that makes a huge difference as well. We do structural types, they do nominal types. And I think the biggest difference of all is these are all very different environments we're living in. This is, kind of, Racket is kind of in the Scheme family, we're building in the JavaScript family. NOM is new, but it's kind of in the C-sharp infrastructure. So probably the fundamental difference is going to be if you do this in a totally different language, you have different implications. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs>